Hello, welcome to day three of the Plon Conference 2021. With me this morning, or this afternoon, could be the evening also, is uh, Philip Bauer. Just a moment, please. And the thing about Philip Bauer is that, uh, oddly enough, he was my first Plon podcast guest, during which I force choked him. And I say this because it's quite relevant to his talk, which is about a new hope get the Star Wars reference. And so you can see today, Philip is channeling the evil side of the force, and he's gonna to talk to us about a tool that he's been working on for clone migrations. Take it away, Philip. Kim, thank you very much for that. Um, I can't read a thing, so I'm gonna take off my glasses now. Um, Somewhere in my biography on Plone Org, it says I'm mostly seen wearing a hoodie, uh, sunglasses and or a hoodie. So I wanted to make, uh, make that true at some point, at least. So I was uh, shortly tempted to call this uh, presentation uh, not a new hope, but a new default for migrations and updates. But um, I guess we should discuss that after the talk. Uh, I'll present something that we at Stanzel.de are using for all of our migrations uh, since early this year, and uh, not only us. And also, uh, I want to show some rabbits um, for obvious reasons. Just look at these beautiful blue eyes. Oh my God. So I've often argued for in-place migrations, and I've worked very hard to make them as accessible and easy as possible. And the problem is that they are just totally not easy and accessible at all. And especially if you have a situation where you need to migrate from archetypes to dexterity, from Python 2 to Python 3, from Plonab multilingual, uh, from lingua plone to Plonab multilingual, from old add-ons to whatever other newer or add-ons from uh, classic to Volto from four to five, from five to six and whatever. And so you, you see all these little steps and I've actually given talks about almost every single one of these steps. Um, and I could talk a lot about every single uh, of these and that they are interesting. The, the one is, so if you, have, if you do an in-place migration, uh, the archetypes versus dexterity, uh, to dexterity thing is certainly the one that I've worked on most. Uh, maybe Python 2 to 3 was a bit more. I, I don't know. The point is uh, archetypes to dexterity, when you do a migration, takes the longest. Python 2 to 3 is actually really fast uh, once you do that in play. If you do that in place because you need to migrate the database only, and that's kind of fast. The other things, let's not go into that. So why is that not changing? Um, so I've given talks about all of these steps in, in various years, 2013 beginning, and uh, this spring I gave a precursor to this talk. It was the last, but Growing Pains is the one about uh, database migration. So you can uh, hear all about these details that I'm not gonna go into that and read all the doc documentation, for example, about mostly the talk migrations, 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 and growing planes, pains about uh, in-place migrations. But there has not or never always been in-place migrations as an option. The other option that was always on the table was transmogrifier. And there was a beautiful training that, um, that our president did uh, in, uh, on training plan org. And uh, Chrissy did a great job to migrate. I think it was a... Um, I have no idea. WordPress to Plone, I think that was it. Uh, ex ex export WordPress data and import it to Plone. The point is, uh, my uh, transmogrifier is is not a tool that is accessible for beginners. Uh, it has somewhat improved code-wise in the last couple of months. I saw some Python three related stuff, but it, it is still a developer only tool, and it's not very accessible. So, a rabbit. Um, so what if we turn this into that? And on top of that, make that accessible to normal people. 
So the whole thing started when Kim, who, um, who introduced me, uh, wrote a flame alert on communityplone.org uh, a while ago, saying the process is complicated and full of black magic. And I was super defensive at that time. I was angry. I wrote to him that the migration process was mostly about Python 3, but basically about all kinds of migrations. This discussion turned into that is neither complicated nor full of black magic. It consists of one simple command that you need to run. And if you don't do that, you're just if you're not able to do that, I can't really help you. Uh, that was super arrogant, and uh, I was obviously wrong. Um, and his, he asked for something um, that does all the migrations at once and has a nice user interface. And I, I thought that it's totally impossible. Um, that's impossibly cute. Uh, but here it is. It is called Collective Export Import, and it has exports and imports for content. Uh, members, groups, and their respective roles, relations, translations, local roles, portlets, default pages, uh, the order of objects in a container, and comments out of the box. And it supports Python Applon 4, 5, and 6 archetypes and dexterity, including all, really all of your custom types. Uh, Python 2 and Python 3, Plone of Multilingual, Prodash Lingual Plone. You can even migrate Raptors multilingual fields, uh, which I did for a client. And the import supports, and that is like the same idea to not support Plone 4 to Plone 4, because why would you want to do that? Uh, to actually to move to the newest system, which is Plone 5.2 or Plone 6, M migrate into Dexterity. That's the plan uh, always. Um, you can import it in Python 2, obviously. Uh, I haven't tried that, but it probably I think it works. It might even import into archetypes. That might even also work because the DC realizers uh, work for archetypes as well. But why would you want to do that? And the multilingual thing only supports uh, Plone app multilingual, not lingua Plone, because that's not supported in Plone 5 and uh, Python 3 anyway. So use case is mostly migrations, obviously, but you can use it to do kind of anything with the content because it serializes your database as JSON. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so you can export data or parts of the database to prepare the migration to another system. You can combine content from multiple plone sites into one. You can export a subsite into another plone site as a subsite. Um, and you can use it, obviously, to import content from other systems into Plone, though you'd have to fit, uh, it has to fit the, uh, the required format, which is well documented. These are really nice. Um, so the whole thing is built around the REST API, because that exists. And at some point last year, uh, I had the idea to why not just use the REST API for migrations, uh, throw the data uh, at the serializer, that's what the first box does, and uh, get the JSON, and uh, throw the same data that you stored on the file system or somewhere uh, and against the deserializer and see what happens, and voila, it worked uh, fine. And the REST API is such an excellent and great tool that it takes care of most of the problems that we would otherwise have in this migration. So this is, it is really eat your own dog food in this case. Um, it has a lot of upsides to use the REST API. One is it is really fast. It supports archetypes, dexterity, Python 2, Python 3, Plone 4, 5, 6, uh, not Plone 3, I think, but if you have a Plone 3 site uh, running, uh, just migrate it to Plone 4 and then install uh, uh, export import and start the migration and start, don't care about uh, you shouldn't care about the theme anyway in that in these cases so um, it's uh, the rest API also makes it very easy to customize uh, the serializers and deserializers like for developers for normal users that's hard because you need marker interfaces, stuff like that. Uh, and it gives you out of the box schema validation, which is super annoying and super powerful. And there should probably a button in the migration to switch it off and on uh, because you, uh, you don't want to import uh, invalid data, but you also uh, don't want to be annoyed by everything. Like ha maybe have a test run 
where you don't run a raise an error every time a deserialization error happens, but export import everything. There's actually a ticket for that, and we should implement that at some point. And since version 1.0 was out, we added a lot of new features. The most important one, obviously, is that you can now export a complete site or a site tree or only certain content. In previous, uh, before 1.2, uh, you could only imp export one content type at a time. And at some point I realized that is stupid and I changed that. Uh, we have now export and import for comments, for portlets. We have fixes for collection queries and lots, lots more, uh, especially hooks. Everyone gets a hook. Uh, demo time, yay. So I'm, uh, I was thinking about doing a real migration during this talk, but uh, I don't want to, I, I shouldn't do that. Uh, so I decided to not uh, because the migration I'm working on at the moment is like 80 gigabytes of data and that would probably take too much time. So here is a example of a plone site. It's a huge intranet and that is the form that I'm calling export content. It's a browser view and it gets you a list of all the content in the site and how many instances there are and you can select which ones you, you want uh, and only export those that you're interested in. Then it gives you a, a, the path of the content that you're, at, uh, uh, that you're at at the moment. It's obviously a German client. They have a content type called Wörterbuch. Now that's from the Help Center glossary. I can um, the, um, choose the width of uh, how, how deep in the folder tree you want to go um, and so on. And more importantly, I'll get to that uh, later in a bit more detail, can decide how you want blobs like binary data, images, and files to be exported as blob paths, uh, base64 encoded string, and download URLs. Uh, the default is base64 because for normal migrations, like not huge sites, you may get big JSON files, but that's not a problem. Big JSON files are fine. Uh, and then you can choose if you want to modify the data for migrations or not. Modifying the data for migrations, for example, makes sure that all fields that were in called uh, something, uh, not camel case, but uh, um, if, uh, I don't know, uh, lowercase at the beginning and uh, uppercase in the middle, in archetypes, uh, now use the proper dexterity naming. So, uh, for example, default page is now default underscore page and not default with a capital P page and stuff like that, uh, which is actually not a schema field, but never mind. I guess you get the idea. So this is, a, you usually just check this. You, that's the default. Uh, it also makes sure, uh, removes all the stuff that you don't want uh, in your serialized data. Uh, and it is obviously the default. I You can switch it off to be, if you're crazy enough to do that, and then you can try a archetypes to archetypes migration. But again, who will want to do that? Um, you can download your data to a local machine, which is obviously the fastest and best option. But if you're running that on a server and your database is not 80 gigabytes sized, uh, saving it, uh, uh, do downloading it is a good option. Otherwise, I switched these around in my head. Uh, saving it to the file on the server is obviously the best solution because it's also uh, it's safer because your connection might just drop and then you lose your downloaded file. It has links to all kinds of exports that come on top of the um, uh, default content export. I'll show you another example of the export. This is also a client. Uh, this is a subsite. So I can I called export content on a subsite, a lineage subsite of that client, and it shows me the content that is in that subsite and uh, apply the path of that subsite automatically. So you can export only a path uh, part of that site. And if I save that, it exports. It is fast in this. Oh, uh, I didn't select anything that was. Stupid. Uh, the select all checkbox is still uh, in, in development, so I haven't done that yet. And when I press export, it does that and tells me, hey, exported 60, uh, 46 items to, and here's my file, and that's the JSON I find. And I can pick that and import that. And once I import that into a, um, uh, that's the other example, the first example, that is actually the full 
finished import of uh, that side uh, with all the data in it. Uh, you get a complete Plone 5 uh, a finished database and there's all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, so um, it, it, it works. Um, and this, look, this is how the import form looks like. You can choose uh, if you download the, the files on the server, you may remember from Zoop there is the uh, um, ZX uh, feature to export and import data. So you have a couple of folders, these two, uh, where you can drop, uh, uh, drop some files and you can choose one of the files, uh, some of the files in these folders to import from these, which uh, again is really good if you have huge files that you don't want to upload through the browser, which would just be stupid. Uh, and then there, here's a feature that's not committed yet into the master. Do a commit after each number of items because this example, this database is really huge. So I say after each thousand items, I do a commit. Uh, so the um, transaction doesn't get really, really big. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second. So this is basically, um, this is basically uh, the demo. I can show you uh, all the exports. They don't look exciting. They all look the same. There is a button that says export whatever, something. Uh, export default pages, export comments. And it's a form and you can click it and you get a, give it, get a JSON file and you can do exactly the same. Uh, this, uh, you take this JSON file and in the import, this is now in uh, the Plone 5 version, you should probably run that in the Plone, uh, in the Plone 4 version, you should probably run that in the Plone 5 version. There's also a form where you upload your JSON file and a click import and every form, uh, every import form, not the export form, has documentation about the desired uh, format, the format that the import expects. So that if you're taking content from a different source uh, or you uh, modify it by hand, uh, you know this is what, what is expected. For example, uh, okay, let's take a really simple example. Default pages look super simple. It is always the same pattern. We use the UUID and then the value. Uh, so this is the UUID here. Translations also very similar, just uh, obvious. These are uh, translation groups. Uh, so these, these files are also really, really small and the import is really, really fast. Okay, let's continue with the presentation after the demo. Um, since the last version, uh, since spring this year, a couple of uh, big things also happened. Uh, we added support for big data. Um, that means we're using generators to, um, to create the data uh, for export. So we don't have one huge uh, JSON uh, li list of JSON objects in in memory, which would uh, um, you would run out of memory, uh, and also we're writing one of these items at a time into a temp file, and uh, um, which doesn't use uh, additional memory, which is pretty smart. Uh, also, we added export and import for blob path. So the JSON file only has the blob path uh, relative from uh, from uh, blob storage. A directory and uh, you can import so you you import uh, from the original blob storage uh, obviously the, in the in the imported database a new blob file in wherever the the import database's blob storage is uh, will be created and indexed and stuff like that because um, yeah that, that is sane uh, so that that is good for import, we're using iJSON because I had a, a, a case where I had a, I don't know, a couple of gigabytes of JSON file and reading that, especially deserializing that in the first, uh, the first instance. And then you have to keep that whole JSON thing into memory is stupid. So there's this nifty library called iJSON where you can actually iterate over JSON files uh, and it's, it's just excellent. And uh, as I already showed, the feature commits every, uh, such and such items. Okay, this is an example for the uh, writing one JSON at a time. If you know me, I'm I, I'm insanely proud if I do something that I think is is smart. I think that is pretty smart. The content generator that you see in the second line is the uh, is the generator. 
datum is the, the data. <laughs> and if it's the first item, it'll just start with a bracket. And after each item, it adds a comma. Um, uh, if it's not the first one, it adds a comma, then it dumps the one JSON item. And if the whole thing is finished, if you exported everything from your database, uh, then it, it'll write the finishing bracket. Um, it is just insanely um, simple, but it took me a long time actually to find that solution. And I've been tinkering around with a temp file, move to the last line and go to the first, and it's a nightmare. Uh, that's iJSON. Uh, where you iterate over iJSON. JSON file is obviously the very, very large file. Uh, and there you uh, take each one item in this uh, generator. Did you know that you can enumerate over generators? I didn't. It's excellent that you can do that because it, uh, even though you don't know how many items you are about to import, uh, probably since you exported them, you will probably know, but you can't display that. But at least you can see, okay, this is number one, doom, doom, and so on. So enumerate works there. Uh, talking about big data, the example, if you export a really good big database, it's 10 gigabytes uh, data FS, 82 gigabytes blobs. This is what you end up in JSON, 643 megabytes of uh, JSON of data. Everything else is uh, relatively irrelevant. Uh, local roles is pretty large, but only because this client has uh, a insane, uh, every item has local roles. Uh, yeah, basically everything in Plone has a local role owner because that's the one person who created that. That's automatically the owner. But this client, everything had has at least additional, a lot of additional local roles. So that's why this file is so big. Ordering is also uh, large because every item is there in there. Every item has a numbering in the folder. It would be excellent if someone told us how to actually walk, either walk the tree in a sane way uh, or uh, do a catalog query, which wouldn't work, doesn't work, uh, that is sorted by path, but inside an, a container, the items inside the container are then ordered by a position in parent. That's obviously it, it pro probably just not possible. These are the other files, they're small. So that's not a problem for your, for your, for your file system. And it, See, like 600 megabytes of data and a 10 gigabyte database. A lot of that is probably revisions uh, and other craft that Plone creates uh, then. So export is really fast. Um, it just reached the database. Uh, everything in that database took 30 minutes plus uh, 20 minutes for all the other stuff like portlets and, and local roles and so on, where you, uh, where you traverse the database, uh, the complete database multiple times. The import obviously is a bit slower because you are creating content uh, and you, so you're writing your, to your database and you, which is a transaction and it triggers lots and lots of scrub subscribers every time something is created, uh, especially indexing content, which is not disabled here. So if you import a 500 megabyte file, which actually exists in this database, uh, then it's indexed uh, if it's readable on this, is, I don't know, ISO file or something like that. Um, also, what's super slow is creating the initial versions of revisions uh, of versioning uh, that is disabled here. So during before import, I disable versioning for all types. And after import, I enable versioning for those that I want to have en enabled. Um, otherwise, it would be slower. Um, if you compare that to, um, so, so this is, has run on my old MacBook. Uh, my new one should arrive next week, I hope. And so next week, it'll be three and a half hours only. Uh, that's the, the, the estimate. Um, but if you compare these numbers to how long only, only the part to migrate this database with archetypes content to dexterity, that would at least be 12 to, to I don't know, maybe much more hours. And here you have done everything, like the whole migration, all the other things haven't, haven't, uh, are, are not in that, in that time. So that is, that is cute. So the whole thing works fine out of the box, uh, but it is built to be customized. So you saw the user interface, uh, 
without any any additions uh, other um, that's just how it works it's built to be customized in a very simple way so i decided to not go uh, down the zop component architecture uh, rabbit hole for this but just subclass it and use a hook uh, this is the export this is the import um, Fred's talk uh, is going to have a lot more details about this. Um, so it's very relaxing. It's a, it's a sleeping rabbit, obviously. Um, this one very simple example for a, uh, for a hook, one of the many hooks that you can use. Here you export the ratings of Chupino two thumbs uh, into, a, 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 into the JSON file. Item is the already created JSON, the deserialized content. Uh, the serialized content, sorry, and it just adds the information about yays and nays. And this is the uh, also chip unit two thumbs uh, during import. In this case, we already have the object. So from the item, we read this information that we just stored and then set the yays and nays as annotations on the object. The setup annotations is by Chipino two thumbs and creates the, uh, the required uh, tuples, uh, lists as annotations. Um, this is another super simple example how you can deal with complex problems. In this case, uh, a client uses Plon Help Center a lot. And uh, you can just change, since Plon Help Center is complex, but actually super simple, it's just folders and documents if you change the type. Because uh, text is stored in a file called, in a data, uh, in a field called text. And title and description is the same, and nothing else in the uh, Plon Help Center actually really matters. So this plus some more, uh, just change any Plon Help Center into a, a container with containers, with documents, with containers, with documents, and uh, adds uh, custom views that I think you actually quickly, uh, shortly view saw for before that. So um, if you want to customize it some more, uh, you can override the serializers and deserializers of REST API uh, using a custom marker interface that you should install with the add-on that you add your custom deserializers in. You can either use the policy or I usually use a very simple content import or content export package that is, is not a namespace package, has one marker, uh, in, uh, one browser marker, uh, browser layer mar as marker interface, and then the subclass uh, of, of, the, uh, of the import uh, and the export, two packages, and I add all my custom code in there. You could also just check out uh, export import and make your changes because this export and import code, like all migration code, uh, is that's to throw away. That's stuff that you don't need after it's done anymore. It's interesting for historical reasons, but it's not uh, relevant as uh, it doesn't need tests because it only runs once, for example. So this package obviously has tests, lots of them, uh, thanks to Maurits, for example, who created the test setup. They run in Plone 4, 5, and 6, and uh, archetypes and dexterity and whatnot. So really good. Um, this is how, how, how it looks when, when it's night. They like to cuddle together. Uh, there's way more hooks than I just showed you. These are just uh, a stupid list of hooks. So what's to do? Um, there is um, one thing that is still missing. There is a pull request, and there is some code in uh, collective migration helpers to fix HTML. I'll quickly show that maybe. Um, because that since between Plon 4 and Plon 5, HTML in rich text fields has changed a lot. Let me show you one example. So number one is obviously we need to, need to use resolve UID. And number two is all the links that to be editable in a tiny MCE need to have not only the href attribute with the link uh, resolve UID in it, but also data link type and data val, which is the UID to when you click on it to be actually able to edit that. The same goes for images and the same goes for, where's that then for, so I, I split that up. Uh, these are all content fields and this is the same goes for portlets. And the same goes for tiles. 
Um, so, so far we have portlets and all content fields, but not tiles. This is still a to-do. Um, this would be something uh, to add because otherwise you have broken uh, image scales. The scales changed. Uh, there's another example in the image thingy here. So they are now use, we're using the images, image traverser, uh, that browser view, and not uh, the old image, something to image new. So this thing will take care of all of that. It's not merged. So this is something uh, to, to finish, finish up uh, the, whole, uh, the whole migration story here. Um, then also it would be nice to have more features that Fredagon is going to talk about because we have stuff like Mosaic. Um, my great uh, Plon Org would be on my uh, bucket list, um, Rico Pekka. I send you a message. It would be interesting to try that or discuss in-place migration. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine either way. Um, then uh, migrate all the crazy number of projects that we've acquired uh, with this, uh, lots of universities and stuff. Um, there is also a huge to-do uh, to migrate Classic to Volta and love to discuss that. I read that uh, Tiberiu has created something to, in Python actually, migrate HTML from TinyMC, like a plone HTML, into Slate. Uh, JS, uh, the new editor, which I really, really love. Uh, so that will be easy to integrate since the whole thing is Python. Uh, there is HTML to Draft.js and there is Draft.js to uh, Slate migrators, but these are uh, node packages. So it would be interesting to see how that would be, uh, what would be required there to make that work. And also if there, it would be possible to migrate tiles uh, to blocks or if it's actually, is it, if it's required, if, is, is that important? Obviously, most of the content in a plon site, unless you use pages, is still uh, schema driven and uh, just uh, data, um, uh, data. So the HTML can stay like it is, but documents have the blocks uh, behavior enabled by default. So it will be really interesting to hear how Kit Concept and others are dealing with migrations uh, of that uh, in with regards to that, uh, because I, I haven't had the uh, pleasure pleasure of doing a migration to Volto yet from, from something that has real HTML. So yeah, love to hear uh, what, what, you, what you're doing about that. Uh, so that it's a very relaxing tool and uh, you can rest safe and um, do all your migrations with this. I'm not sure going back to the uh, original, um, be beginning of my talk, if this is the new default, because um, at least from for minor versions and also for major versions, unless you change your content type framework or your Python version or many, many other things from classic to uh, Volto, uh, the in-place migration is really excellent and works fine uh, unless you break your database uh, or you have issues with your database and then you need to read a lot of text that I've written at some point. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if um, I, I need, uh, when, when I have a client and he, they ask me, okay, we, we have this project, uh, it's always uh, my job to decide, is that in place or is that export import? And uh, in re recently, more often than not, it's gonna be export import or it was export import, but there's one big migration that's on the horizon for a client from us, of us that is certainly uh, in place even though it is it is complex, but it ha it is more application like than website like. It's less content and uh, structure and stuff. It's more uh, has too much uh, custom complexity. Um, so I I that is the question. It if can we make a uh, recommendation to the public or is it uh, open to again? Uh, consultants to uh, give tips. Thank you for your um, for joining and watching and I'd, I love to discuss this and watch the talk by Fred who's going to go into much more technical detail and uh, look at the nooks and crannies in there and um, yeah, see you in Slack. Hello, thank you.
I love how my asking Flemish questions leads you to strike back with hate. Let the, let the evil flow through you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed Philip's talk. He's always full of amazing stuff. I don't know how he sleeps. Maybe he doesn't sleep. That's probably it. Uh, please join Philip in the Jitsi, which is the blue button below. And I will post the link as well in the Slack. Oh, he started, but it's not Ardbeg. So, all right, see you in the Slack. Thank you very much, Philip.